Okie dokie, welcome back. So today we are gonna go over audit techniques and tools 101. We're almost to the end, I think. Um, so this one was an interesting one, probably one of my favorites. Uh, it's, it's a toss up between this one and the last one. Reason being is that this specific Substack post within the Securian Bootcamp focuses mainly on processes and techniques of how auditors actually do auditing today within the smart contract community. And um, I think the next one is gonna be pretty interesting as well, but one of the main takeaways I've kind of grasped from this whole concept is actually going out and reading as many audit reports as possible uh, from a variety of security firms and also trying to dig deep into where they talk about their processes and seeing if they have methods and checklists and things that they follow that they've publicly disclosed that others could learn from. Um, but yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of one of the things I will do after I finish this boot camp, along with a series of other things I want to do. Um, as, I, as I go through this, I figure out more what I want to do. All right, um, so first things first is, this is the Substack post, and this are our, these are our notes. So there's a lot of text in these notes, not as many as pictures, sadly. Um, so I'm gonna kind of skim through everything. I'm not gonna dive into details because a lot of this is actually for me to refer to back in the future. Um, but with that being said, here are some interesting takeaways that I've taken from this specific segment of the course. Here at the top, you can see it's uh, talking about audit auditing techniques is a big segment in the first part of the uh, section. And one of the things that I took from that is that, uh, or maybe I kind of put in my own head, I don't remember, um, but these techniques uh, are gradient when it comes to automation. So everything is not automated. It just depends on the project. It depends on the person. It depends on their approach. So some of this will be manual, some will be automated, some will be semi-automated, some will be fully automated. It's just kind of uh, the, the nature of the interaction you have with the client. Uh, the next thing here is breaking down the different techniques. So the very first one they speak to here is uh, specifications. And one thing, sadly, uh, that I realized here is specifications and uh, quality documentation, which is mentioned here as well for the next step, is hard to come by when it comes to at least a new project that is uh, focused on speed and not necessarily quality. So that actually takes a lot of time from the auditor because they have to spend more time inferring um, what the application is meant to do instead of just looking at the documentation and reading the specifications and mapping those back and forth. But if you do have specifications, uh, really, the first thing that most auditors will, will do is they'll actually look at um, the the, uh, the project's website, their specifications, their documentation, and really try to get an understanding of what this project is trying to do and uh, what is the purpose, why does it exist, all that stuff. And you can see here um, some of the questions that one would ask when reading the specifications is basically figuring out um, what matters to this group. So what are the assets? Who's, who's kind of interacting with these assets? What privileges do they have? Um, there's a series of other questions here around relationships, who trusts who, uh, how much trust is given to each one of those parties. Um, it's kind of a general thing is threat modeling. So this is really at the end of most um, audits or most interactions around security. That's a common kind of web two thing. And that's the main piece here for specifications that I wanted to cover. Um, that's kind of the piece of reading that. Below that is documentation. Here's a lot of what I've already said up there. Um, a lot of the same stuff. And as we go through this, I'll mention some more stuff about specifications and documentation, but for now, that's kind of all I wanted to mention there. Next thing here is testing. So once you've actually understood what the project does, why it exists, and the intent behind it, then you can actually start testing things. Um, one of the very first things that you'll actually do uh, outside of just your own testing is examining and reviewing the developer's testing. And one interesting thing I've heard from a series of auditors from different lectures and conversations is actually when you see a project that has minimal testing and the code coverage for those tests is, is minuscule, uh, it's, there's, a, there's an assumption that some auditors make is that if you're lazy in your ability or willingness to actually write quality tests for the code that you're um, deploying, that's a good sign of low-lying bugs and low-lying vulnerabilities and exploits available. Um, due to the fact that if you're lazy in your tests, you're probably lazy in your ability to write secure and uh, comprehensive code. Don't know if that's true. I'm not audited. My, I'm not audited contracts myself, but that's what others have stated. So that's kind of a, a thing that auditors look for is that, like I said, tests are bad. Might be code quality might be bad. And here's just some testing tools that were mentioned in the Substack that I've saved. I've heard um, that Hardhat is like the up and comer, and Brownie is kind of like the 
the one that a lot of people use along with truffles kind of old school but we'll see we'll see because i'll do it myself sometime next is static analysis so this is uh this area and the next few areas are tend to be the mainly highly talked about sections um, with most videos and articles and things that you come across for auditing and things like that and um, static analysis and fuzzing and all that stuff this is all web 2 oriented things like we do this in web 2 but the way that um, I guess not the way but the tools that they use here are obviously different and static analysis uh, if you're not aware of it it's basically um, looking at the code so you're looking at either the usually the source code and when you're looking at the source code you're going to run a static static analysis tool over that static hence the, um, the pro program is static so it's not running and that's the, the premises of static analysis and one of the tools that I've heard a lot about um, and I plan on playing with myself is actually Slither. It's more than just a static analysis tool. There's tons and tons of stuff that it does. Um, but the main thing that I want to try out is first doing the static analysis and then trying maybe some of the, the graphs that it creates and things like that. But um, in a nutshell, static analysis is you have your snippet of code. You're going to run the static analysis tool over it. And then that's going to basically tell you what are some of the common, um, what are some of the common security uh, best practices and pitfalls that are obvious here that are well known and they'll basically tell you that and this is another tool that's uh, used for that all right um next and let's let's mark this off because that's what we do we mark stuff off oh no oh no all right uh next is fuzzing so fuzzy wuzzy uh fuzzing is one tool that that is commonly used within web 2 for fuzzing is burp suite. I'm sure you've heard of that if you're in security. And uh, with fuzzing specifically here, we're doing a very similar approach where we're just going to take a ton of data and really that's all it is. It's, it's fuzzing. You're just taking a bunch of data, um, different random forms of data, and then you're putting it into the inputs that are accessible for the user. And here's a really simplistic kind of situation where you have uh, our computer and we're fuzzing it. So we're going to put in, um, we're going to put in symbols. We're going to put in different languages. We're going to put in emoji characters. We're going to put all kinds of stuff here and we're going to see if any of these inputs that we've we've kind of forced into this input section if anything comes back that's interesting that we could potentially exploit that's really it you're automatically throwing data at the wall and seeing what sticks um, the two popular tools i mentioned here are these two i've not heard of either um, but not a surprise to me and if we keep going uh symbolic checking so this one and the next one are a little kind of kind of confusing to me because it's somewhat new uh to me at least. And so symbolic checking, my understanding is that you're basically trying to um, go through all the trees of a program and see what path has potential vulnerabilities or flaws or discrepancy inside of it. And there was a lecture that I watched that kind of explained this, um, at least as one section, understandably to me. And you can see, I think this FSM is um, finite state machine. And you can see there's different types of testing, but the symbolic checking here, you can see that we're starting at this path here and we're going to run through every single path here. And that's why they're kind of, uh, blued out with blue and not gray. And you can see this, this initial type type of testing, which they've stated as simulation and testing. You're only going down one path, but with symbolic checking, you're going down all the paths. So you're trying to basically see all the spaces and this type of testing is applicable to smart contracts, depending on the size. Reason being is that smart contracts usually are between, you know, 500 and 1,000 lines of code. If you try to do the same process to like uh, the Chrome browser or maybe some large application like, I don't know, WhatsApp, uh, you might not necessarily have, um, it won't be as practical in the sense because there's so many, so many lines of code and the number of paths that one can take when executing this program is not infinite, but it's, it's drastically larger than a smart contract. Hence the reason why symbolic checking is actually possible within auditing contracts. Next, formal verification. This was way over my head. At least like once you've read probably like 10 minutes of it, it starts to get very technical. Um, formal verification, from my understanding, is that we're doing a few series of things. And actually one video that was helpful for me to understand this was one around Cardano, uh, where I know it's not Ethereum, but this, this ethos and this premises is kind of similar where with formal verification, you have a series of steps. So you have a scientific document, which I think that's not necessarily the case. Um, I mean, it might be the case with some Ethereum stuff, but let's just say this is a step that's optional. And below here, we have a formal specification that's then derived from the scientific document. Maybe, maybe not. 
and the formal spec uh, tends to have some fancy mathematics inside of it. And those fancy mathematics uh, then have to be implemented and that, that, that's then implemented into code. So then our next goal here is to basically verify that the implementation here matches up with the formal specifications math. And it, we, we want to ensure that these are similar. And we, we can, by doing that, we can actually formally prove that this, um, that this program is pr provably correct, which is why I highlighted this here. And that's a way of mathematically saying that the way we expect this program to function, we've proved that out by basically validating that the implementation and the formal specifications mat match up correctly. And there's a series of tools that can help you do that. Um, some of the tools here mentioned of doing so. And that's uh, one of the more advanced testing techniques. And uh, it's kind of all the rage right now, at least from what I've heard. Um, all the rage in, in the sense that it's practical, but probably too many people talk about it and it's getting a little uh, trendy. But either way, it's something that a lot of uh, contract contracts are using and projects are uh, leveraging. So um, interesting concept. And that's something I will dive into more in the future. And I think this is the last one is manual analysis. So this is another area that you'll hear a lot about and you'll see a lot of when you're researching this topic of security auditing is this is where really the human, um, both in addition to the testing and all that stuff, this is a key element. So this is when you, the auditor, you look at the code and you manually re review it. Reason this is useful is that actually the business logic and the application level constraints, all that stuff is sitting on top of the language. So we have um, the EVM bytecode, right? And then above that we have the language. And then above that we have the app, right? And then above that we have the business logic. And when you think about this, when most of the testing we can run that's automated is really focused on this section down here, outside of maybe some of the formal verification stuff. And the human, uh, we need to basically work on the stuff above this. Reason being is that the testing tools aren't, aren't capable of doing this yet. Um, but also at the same time, as a human, you can actually infer what others meant by the specifications documentations they wrote and try to look at more complex uh, faults and exploits and vulnerabilities um, either at the application level. So what, what inferences or what assumptions have been made here that are faulty that we can take advantage of. Uh, the same thing applies for the business logic. So this is quite high, higher level than the application stuff, but at the same time, there's you know the concepts of uh, front running and things like that, or reentrancy attacks, which sits at that level of the business logic because you're using the application as expected, but you're doing it in a manner and manipulating it in a way that actually benefits you in the long run. Or the short term, short term, not long run. Um, cool. So this part, I won't really talk about, but I thought it was great that they included this. And I think that, I mean, if anything, if you don't read the entire thing, just take that piece out. Um, let's try uh, firms. Yeah, point 30. It has basically a link to not all of them, but a series of auditing firms that it's a great way to, a great way to start, right? So you can go to a lot of these places here. So let's go to diligence and you can see audits. And under audits, you can see all the audits that they've, they've done. I don't know how far it goes back, but you can actually download these audits and inside of the audit, this is like a great, for at least from my like brief reading of these, this is, a, is an amazing place to start as just trying to understand what auditors look for. And if you look at enough of these audits, you'll start to try and find patterns and trends, which is kind of the intent of uh, one of the video series you want to make in the future. All right. But that being said, we'll go to the next piece. Okay, so next piece is talking about the audit process. So above was techniques. So what types of techniques are utilized? And now this next part is talking about, okay, now we have all these techniques. How do we order them in a cohesive manner that most auditing firms follow? So what kind of steps do they take to ensure that this contract's secure? So the process is here, I've mentioned very high level. So first we're gonna read English. So that goes to the specifications and documentation. Next, we're gonna run fast. So that means we're gonna do the static analysis because static analysis um, tends to have lower false positives, higher fidelity data. And a lot of the stuff that comes back is quite rapid. So you can actually see if there's a flaw or not quite quickly. Um, next, you're gonna do, uh, you're gonna read the code. So that's the manual process of us kind of going through and looking at the app logic and business logic. Uh, next, we're gonna run slow. So this could be symbolic checking, fuzzing, things like that. So these tools are um, more uh, resource intensive, take more time, but also they need more expertise. Uh, next is call a friend. So this is basically um, speaking to your fellow auditors inside of the firm that you work at or elsewhere and basically figuring out, okay, did I miss anything here? Um, what, what did you see that I didn't see? What did I see that you didn't see? And brainstorming on certain ideas around that. 
Uh, next is asking the devs. So this is more of a continuous process where you're working with the people at the project. And for you to actually infer what the intent of the program is faster, in addition to reading the docs and specs, is actually having a, an open line of communication between yourself and that project to really figure out specifically what their intent was, asking specific questions to different snippets of code so they can help you, um, I guess, reduce the learning curve and the time it takes you just to get to a point of where you can start validating if it's secure or not. Um, next is write, so that's where you're gonna write your report for the audit. Uh, you'll present it. This is where you're basically gonna debate your findings with the project. And then last is review. So if the project decides to go back and fix some of the things you've recommended, and, and if you want to go back and kind of re-audit, you can go back there and re-review the fixes and ensure that um, the project is meeting the expectations that you've set for them. So at a high level, this is a process. Now, let's go deeper into each one of the steps. Um, so the point that I want to make here is the difference between uh, a spec and a doc. So a specification really touches on the why. So why does this, uh, project exists, what, why is the smart contract doing what it's doing, um, you know, what's the intent behind this. And then below that, the, the docs are basically showing you how it's implemented. So based off the why, so we know why this thing exists and, and why they're creating this and why they're doing certain, certain things certain ways, um, but now um, we want to know how. So how specifically do they plan on doing that? What's the design? And I've already made this point, uh, specs and docs are hard to come by for new projects. All right, so once we've run that, next part is running fast. So uh, we've already talked about this. Let's see if there's anything new that I want to mention. Uh, nope, nothing new. Cool. So we can go to the next thing. Uh, like I said, static analysis mainly that's what you're going to do there. Um, code reading, anything new I want to mention here? No, this is great. We're making so much progress. Fuzzers. Um, yeah, so I made this point already, uh, but I'll reemphasize it. Uh, with fuzzers, uh, symbolic checkers, and formal verification, all these tools, ooh, bad line, bad line. Let's try this again. Here we go. Actually, you know what, internet, but you didn't know that I had a fourth button here. Boom, rectangle. All right, um, so what I wanted to point out here is with fuzzers, symbolic checkers, and formal verification, all of these actually um, take more expertise. So knowing how to manipulate these tools to function correctly, knowing what input parameters you need to put inside of these tools to actually have them work efficiently, all these things come into play. But if you know how to use, leverage the tools and if you have experience with them as an expert uh, in auditing and things like that, then you can actually start to come out with more edge case flaws, which is mentioned here, and also uh, mathematical errors and, and overall more complex vulnerabilities and exploits can be potentially derived from this process because of the additional effort and how deep these tools are going. Okie dokie. Um, call a friend. So we've already talked about this, but I'll, I'll mention some things that were mentioned inside of this Substack post. Uh, so the way that they broke it down in the Substack post is that there's three different types of firms. So there's firms that start, uh, so they have your different auditors, right? So you have a group of auditors. So we have all our auditors here. Uh, then we have our smart contract project and we have our farm. And the firm basically has all these baby auditors. And what's gonna happen sometimes, depending on the size of the project, you may send uh, one auditor to the project, or you may send all the auditors or a group of auditors to the project. And if you do send a group of auditors to the project, or at least maybe more than one, um, there's, there's different approaches you can take there. So you can take the together approach, which is basically stating that these auditors are gonna to work together the entire time. They're never gonna be siloed off. So it means they're gonna go through the entire process we discussed above. Um, together. Uh, the next one is siloed. So you would basically silo off each of the auditors and they would go through the processes on their own without interacting with the other auditors from the same firm. And the last one is hybrid. So maybe you start out together, you read the specs and docs together, you get a general idea of what the app is doing together. So you can kind of all can uh, infer what the intent is. Then you start going siloed off to then dive into the code separately. And then you'll converge back um, at the end to discuss your findings. So that's the hybrid approach. And the reason that one would want to do any of these is that the together uh, approach is useful for kind of reducing the learning curve and uh, making progress more, I guess, quickly. But at the same time, it's, uh, it's bias. So you can have a lot of collective um, discussion and everybody can kind of follow the herd. Or maybe there's one person in the room that talks over everybody else. This is a common issue with a lot of uh, larger group projects is one person will basically make the decisions for everybody else. Um, next one is siloed. So this is useful, um, but at the same time, even though it does minimize bias, this may take more time and uh, it may kind of, uh, the quality of the audit for each auditor might vary. Uh, 
Um, so it depends on your time and the amount of uh, money that one wants to spend on this. And the last one, uh, the author basically mentioned this, this may or may not be one of the better methods. Reason being is that you're kind of getting the best of both worlds without spending too much money, wasting, wasting too much time and uh, things like that. So yeah, that was the thing I wanted to mention there. All right, ask the devs. Um, we've already discussed this, so we can skip it. Uh, writing the report. Uh, really the only thing I'll mention here is that there's a significant portion of this Substack post that talks a lot about um, spe specifically the likelihood and impact of an exploit. So how does a firm actually rate risk? And that's a really hard thing to do from time to time, um, specifically really anywhere, even in Web2. So how do you rate risk and what variables come into play to actually uh, give that risk a one or a 10 depending on severity? And really the two largest variables for really most risk in Web2 as well as Web3 is how likely is it for uh, an attacker to exploit this? How easy is it for them to do it basically? And also how impactful is that? So if I send a string of code, aka lock or J to your you know, external endpoint, and I can actually you know, gain you know, remote code access on that, then uh, that's, that's very likely and that's very high impact. So it's a very high risk thing. Um, but if it's not that way, and it takes me to have to go through like four different levels of security, and I have to have certain conditions to be met and things like that, and the impact is very minimal, that's low risk. So that's kind of the uh, one thing I wanted to point out there when it comes to writing your report and also one of the really important parts of actually rating risk. Um, present. So the one piece I wanted to mention here is actually debating your findings. So there's interesting things here that need to be mentioned, but I won't mention those now. Uh, this part here, debating findings. When you present your report to a project, um, you're not always going to be... Um, the authority kind of say all end all so what i say goes and when you come to say that there's an exploit that you rated as a 10 instead of a you know a four you need to really kind of sometimes debate those findings and explain exactly where you're coming from uh, the project owners and developers might push back on it and that's where you kind of have to lay out the evidence and say this is how I, this is what i think and this is what i found um, take it or leave it but that's just a really interesting aspect of this kind of exchange between yourself and the client it's not necessarily a, a traditional uh, relationship that most people would have with a client where you're not necessarily just coming to them and saying, yes, I'll do whatever you want because you're paying me. Uh, you're really actually coming back to the client and pushing a bit to uh, make them better and also make the entire ecosystem better. This path, last piece, I've already talked about this. So it's basically validating the fixes that the developers have put in place after you've made recommendations. All right. This is the last piece, I think. We'll take a tea break. This, um, this is about the process of manually reviewing code. And I've actually linked a video here that I really enjoyed and I, I will watch twice. I've already watched once, it's two and a half hours. That's why I've only watched it once. But this individual, um, Mudit Gupta, uh, he has been in crypto for five years or six years and has made a lot of contributions in a lot of different places, uh, both in security and development. And he actually did a live stream here. Basically going live and auditing contracts that were sent to him prior. And he recently put out a new one a month ago that I have not watched yet, but I'm looking forward to, where he basically just walks you through um, his process of auditing a contract and his approach to thinking about how one should look at certain bits of code. And he gives a lot of really nuanced insights that you don't necessarily get from a blog post or a book. It comes from experience and it's, it's small things that people don't necessarily sometimes think about saying or mentioning in a blog post, but he kind of, he, he says them both directly and indirectly inside of this, these videos. And it's uh, really, really good. Highly recommend it. And it aligns perfectly with this section. All right. So what is the manual process uh, when reviewing code? What are the things that you consider? Um, so first things first is uh, access, access controls. So who has access where and when? Uh, asset flow, so what assets are moving around and how and who has access to those. Uh, control flow, very similar to, uh, actually not access, but control flow is like the logic flow, so how is the code executing. Data flow, how is data changing over time. Constraints, uh, what are the uh, specified constraints and are some of these constraints uh, faulty. Dependencies, uh, how many dependencies do your contract have and other things that you don't know about. Assumptions, uh, what assumptions have I made that are faulty and checklists, do I have those and should I follow them. All right, so this is the high level piece of what we're gonna do. I have in-depth bits here that we're gonna walk through. All right, so let's knock that out and do that. All right, so access control. We've talked about this in the Solidity 101 and 201 section uh, in depth, but I'll give a quick high level overview here and I have a snippet of code that I'll share. 
but access control specifically is basically stating who has access to what. That's as simple as it goes, right? So what users and what contracts have access to what assets and what basically uh, functions and things like that. And what constraints are put on top of those access controls and are they are those constraints uh, secure enough or can I manipulate them in some way? Specifically, we talked about in the previous videos, uh, ownable contracts and RBAC roles from Open Zeppelin. And I don't think I have this open yet, but it's saved for me, so perfect. All right, so what I wanted to share here is something I've already talked through, but just to show you kind of specifically what I was referring to when it comes to access controls. Uh, we have two examples here, one for ownable and one for um, RBAC stuff. So here we have a modifier. So we're pulling in a contract ownable and the modifier uh, only owner. So here you can see that basically this specific function uh, can only be called by the owner. So that is a specific access control and we want to make sure that that's set up for the functions that need it. And the next one is basically role-based stuff. So we have roles.role .role for mentors and burners, and we are inheriting that from another contract. And specifically, we have a series of, uh, we have a constructor, functions, et cetera. And what we're doing here, we've already talked through this in the past, we're basically um, adding a mentor uh, inside of this constructor. So once this uh, contract initializes, we have the constructor that's basically going to create a mentor and a burner. We're going to come down here, we're going to say, okay, well, uh, is the mentor the one that we think it is? So uh, mentors can mint. So if the sender is a mentor, then they can they can mint. Um, and if the burner is uh, a burner from the sender, then it can it can burn. So these are specific types of access controls, and you want to review those and ensure that um, they meet the certain constraints that one should have when it comes to access. All right, next one, asset flow. This one has a series of questions that are that are nice to actually have and think about. Um, as you're kind of going through this process of understanding how asset flow should be considered. But as I mentioned, so asset flow is basically your, the, way your, the way your assets flow. And this is basically saying, okay, withdrawals and deposits. How, how are withdrawals occurring? How are depo how deposits occurring? Uh, how does the asset flow in, out, within the contract and across smart contracts? And really asking questions around, um, is the right person slash contract ac accessing these assets? Uh, is it around uh, the right time or condition? It, the, does the time and condition meet that fact that person can play with that asset? Um, is it the right asset? So are they are they in, they're interacting with the right asset within this contract? Um, is it the right reason? Have they met the specific time and conditions, but also what's the intent behind the use of this function interacting with the asset? Um, is it the right place? Referring to the contract. Um, and also uh, is it the right amount? So they're trying to exceed or go under a set amount they should have. So these are all interesting questions that one should ask when looking at asset flow. Um, next is control flow. So look, we have some pictures. This is amazing. Uh, control flow is basically the execution of a contract, a function, a program, etc. So you're basically going to walk through uh, the controls set with inside of this program and how they interact and, and what occurs next. And here they basically mentioned that there's inter, inter and intra. So inter control flow is referring to within and across contracts. So this is wider. So we're going a bit wider. We're looking at inside a contract and across contracts. And you can see it's between functions, which is kind of a given if you're if you're if you're deep into code. And then intra is between uh, it's within functions. So I guess it's pro probably the point that I wanted to mention here is that uh, a simple way of thinking about this is inter between intra within I'm referring to functions. And intra is basically referring to the conditionals and uh, loops and return statements within that function. And how does that code execute with inside the function? Uh, some specific images I have here. So a super simple image of simplistic if then else statements uh, do until, so this is not solidity, but generally I forgot what code it was, but the general code kind of constructs. And here you can see there's different things happening. So this if then else control flow is saying this thing happens and there's a con there's a conditional decision that has to be made so if this thing happens then go this way then else go this way and then the same thing applies here this is a do until so it's basically saying do this thing keep doing it and if this thing if this condition changes if it's met then uh, then continue but if not keep doing this thing and the same thing applies for the others uh, below this is a app that i'm not used but it shows control flow uh, within a Solidity contract, and I, I do want to use this, I've just not had the time to tinker with it. Um, but this is, I think it's called Visual, Visuals, Visual Studio Code Map for Solidity or something like that, 
But you can see here simplistically that they have a contract in the background and they're basically showing you the control flow of that contract and you can select different um, items within the diagram to see how that flow goes throughout the contract and it's a really um, intuitive and effective way to get a general idea of how this contract functions without jumping into the code. And you could kind of do this maybe first before doing the manual process of reviewing the code if you're a noob like me. And it's just another picture right here of like kind of the macro picture. You can see kind of all the flows happening within this contract. And that is control flow. All right, next, data flow. So data flow is the way that data changes over time. So as a contract executes, different sets of data are changed based off of the functions and things that happen within that contract. So we have the same as we did above. So we have enter and intra. So enter within this context is basically stating the uh, parameters that are going into the function. So this is across function calls because the parameters that come into a function or return from a function are going in between functions. And then the intra is smaller. So enter bigger, intra smaller. Intra is focusing within the function. So this is basically happening within the loops and the conditionals that we mentioned previously. Now you can see here that I mentioned that there's two different types of data sets or that we're looking at. So we have uh, variables and constants, and then we have uh, state memory and call data. I think I have a code snippet here from Open Zeppelin that I wanted to show. I think this is the, let me go to the top. This is the ownable. Yeah, this is an access control solidity snippet from Open Zeppelin. And at the very bottom, there's some functions here I wanted to kind of show you where you can see down here, we have some uh, local variables in here. And these local variables would be considered the intra because we're within the function. Maybe I'm wrong because this is being passed into here, which is passed elsewhere. All right, that is a lie. This is enter. So the reason I, I kind of realized that now is because we can see there's a parameter here, role, which is being manipulated here, placed into this local variable, which is then emitted through an event, um, but in the end kind of looped back into role, which I'm sure is then passed elsewhere. Um, so that's going to be the enter. There is no intro example here, but I did want to show kind of what an example would look like if you're looking at a snippet of code for data flow. And you can kind of track and see how that data changes over time. And is it changing as expected? And if not, are there ways you can manipulate that data as it changes uh, to benefit you as an attacker? All right, next is constraints. So we've talked about this a bit, so we might be able to skip over it. Uh, really the premise of this piece here is saying that the, the picture I drew over here last time. So remember last time we had uh, the business logic up here. We had the app logic here. Below that was language. Below that was the EVM bytecode. So as I mentioned previously, the, the human focuses up here most of the time. Tests focus down here most of the time. But in the context of constraints, the constraints within the language and the EVM bytecode that's pretty well known and pretty well uh, solidified and kind of trusted due to the fact that a lot of people have had eyes on Solidity, the code itself, and also the EVM, the way that it's structured and how it functions and designs. But above that, these constraints here are set by the project. And the security constraints here need to be set correctly. And if they're not set correctly and there's some faults in the constraints that someone set around their code, then those constraints then can be manipulated uh, that are either not there or implemented incorrectly. And a constraint is similar to the access controls point that I made earlier. If those access controls were set up incorrectly or not there at all, that would be a uh, kind of an example of a constraint that was either, uh, you know, not there or flawed. So that is an example of constraints. Dependencies. So this is a common web two thing. So there's not really much I can say here that's new or interesting outside of what you probably already know, but this image is great. And I've seen this probably way too many times in the last six months because of so many crazy, crazy things that have been happening um, in the web too. But as you know, there's a lot of open source libraries and open source code that a lot of developers use within large enterprise uh, infrastructure. And that is sometimes managed by, you know, a random person in Nebraska that's been thankfully doing this since 2003. 
And this is a really funny graphic that you've probably seen in a lot of different places. But the point that's here on dependencies is that as a project for smart contracts, you're inheriting um, a lot of other contracts, you're calling functions outside of your contract of code that you've not written yourself. So that's one consideration that an auditor would want to look at is that where is this inheriting from? Is it a confirmed kind of secure place that a lot of eyes have been on, such as Open Zeppelin? If so, maybe I can skip that. But if it's a smaller project that this contract is inheriting from, that's not well known, it might not necessarily be that secure, that might be an opportunity for me as an attacker or an auditor to figure out, okay, is there something I can manipulate here or um, a weakness within the inheritance that this is pulling from that would give me an advantage? That's kind of the dependencies piece. All right, assumptions. So this is another series of questions or example assumptions that are useful. So assumptions are kind of similar to the constraints where I as a human or I as a developer, when I'm writing this code, what assumptions have I baked into the way that I've developed this that could be faulty in a way? And you can see faulty, faulty assumptions. I'll quickly read through these so you can kind of get an example of what that is. So uh, one example is uh, only admins can call these functions. So that's an assumption that I've made. So I'm assuming that only the admin can touch the functions that I care about. Another one is saying that when, this, uh, when initializing the function, uh, it'll only be called once when deployed. So this is similar to the constructor, but upgradable, upgradable contracts can't use constructors. Uh, I think they have like uh, initializers, I think that's what it's called, something like that. And those are meant to be only called once, but sometimes if implemented incorrectly, they can be called multiple times, which causes some issues. Um, another one here is saying that uh, all the functions that I've written are gonna run in a specific order that I've specified. That's not always the case. Another assumption that could be wrong is that parameters uh, that are passed in could be uh, are, are only non-zero values or um, are set within a certain threshold. But as you know, underflows and overflows is a common attack in many Web 2 and happens Web 3 as well. Uh, another thing here is uh, saying that yeah, the wording of this is kind of off, so I'm just going to scratch that out. That's probably the reason why I've added this bit here. Um, this basically is saying that there's certain areas within the contract sh that should be unreachable. Uh, to most uh, public uh, users. There's certain subsets of users should have access to this. That is a common assumption that is faulty a lot of the time, both in Web 2 and Web 3. And here we're basically saying that fuzzing is an idea of where you can fuzz certain endpoints uh, or inputs and then put a bunch of stuff in there and then that might give you access to private locations based off the input you put in there, um, like directory traversals and things like that. And last thing is around return values. So as you run a function, uh, you expect that this will always be successful, so there's no reason to check the return values uh, because you know you're always going to be right, and that is a faulty assumption that happens all the time. All right, we're almost there. We're almost there. Oh no, what did I just do? I just made it super bright. Let's not do that. All right, uh, last one is checklists. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this uh, checklist. Basically. This is something that I do want to find because I know that I hopefully there is something out there publicly from auditing firms where they've actually publicly disclosed their checklist of what they go through. Um, but this Substack post series, as the author mentioned, is a, uh, an example of a checklist. So you can kind of look at these massive Substacks and say, okay, as I'm doing an audit or as I'm kind of learning more about this and running through my own personal audit, what are some considerations or mentions in here that I should then apply to that audit? This is a form of a checklist. And um, checklists are important for all kinds of really critical jobs, such as uh, flying planes, uh, being a doctor, doing surgery, things like that. Even though you're an expert, there's so many steps that are nuanced and needed for something to go successful that it's always important to have a checklist, even if you're doing, if you're doing this practice for 30 years. Uh, with that being said, that is everything. And I hope you enjoyed this. I did. I'll see you next time.